Good day, I'm Peter Santos. Welcome to Weekend Edition. Glad you could join us. It was in January when in the span of a week, four firefighters from the Guam Fire Department tested positive for COVID-19. Jo Joe Nogan Charfras has more on what the department is doing to ensure the health and safety of its personnel. It's been almost a month since the first of four firefighters from the Guam Fire Department tested positive for COVID-19. All were assigned to the Istanbul Fire Station and were from the same shift. Since then, there have been additions to their health and wellness policies. According to Battalion Chief Ed Chaco, he was surprised by the rise in positive cases. We've had 10 different workplace exposures in which crew members were exposed to a COVID positive patient during their infectious period. And we've managed to only um, infect three other people. And so the other seven stations were able to effectively mitigate and manage, um, you know, uh, in hindsight, uh, dealing with a COVID positive uh, coworker. Chief Chaco, along with Captain Kevin San Nicholas, who both serve as GFD's infection control specialists, identified some gaps within their policies and made some revisions to provide more clarity when it comes to their pre screening process. They also implemented workplace mitigation strategies. So the message um, that we're putting out to the guys is that the finish line is in sight, albeit it's far, but it's in sight. So if we stay our course and we understand that the vaccinations alone will not singularly prevent the spread of COVID, we need to do that in conjunction with our uh, workplace mitigation strategies. And if we do them in tandem, then we'll, we'll get through this together. Just the constant reminder uh, to our guys, you know, just because we're still in a heightened state of awareness regarding COVID, we just want to make sure that th those things are, are practiced and practice even more when we're just around each other. They hope the five-part workplace mitigation strategy will help prevent the spread of COVID. The first part is pre-screening and making sure that personnel know that even though symptoms subside after a day or if they feel it's relative to a medical condition such as allergies, they need to inform their supervisor. For pre-screening, firefighters are um, instructed to conduct a self-assessment and if they have any of the um, pre-identified symptoms that they call the supervisor and to let them know that you know they're, they're, they're feeling ill. Second one is pre-screening. Uh, uh, screening at work. So as when they report to work, they're supposed to report to a, an entry location outside the building. They are the temperatures are to be checked and they're to ask be asked a series of questions regarding the symptoms. The third mitigation factor is wearing the mask. The fourth is social distancing, maintaining six feet at all times. And the last is constant disinfection of all areas, such as the break room. We hope that we've added clarity to our wellness policy so that we can prevent future spread amongst firefighters. We all have to do our part too. And also uh, the public doing their part also helps uh, the first responders uh, and provide whatever needed uh, measures and, and, and treatments to them when we go into the public. So, you know, uh, we all always ask everybody to, to continue to, to wear their mask, wash their hands, and do what they need to do, too, because, you know, we come out and we help you, but we also need protection, too. All but one firefighter has since returned to duty. To date, there have been a total of 16 GFD personnel who have tested positive for the coronavirus. 165 personnel have been vaccinated, with 163 receiving both doses. Chief Chaco adds that seven who initially opted not to be vaccinated have since changed their minds. Reporting for Guam's News Network, I'm Jonah Gancharfres. Last week during its monthly meeting, the Peace Officer Standards and Training Commission met virtually to discuss an array of topics that range from a pair of bills recently introduced by Senator James Moylan, which would help with the streamlining of re the recruitment process of law enforcement officers to revisiting the use of force policies. Guam Police Department Chief Stephen Ignacio mentioned that as a result of a presidential executive order signed during the Trump administration in June 2020, which prohibits the use of a chokehold, the island's law enforcement agencies will have to review their policies. Ours is under review uh, because this is a legal matter of uh, use of force. Uh, the Attorney General and I actually spoke about this, uh, this executive order and he's aware of it. And uh, that uh, he's uh, having our use of force policy actively reviewed by one of the uh, dep uh, deputy attorney generals. Your law enforcement agency, uh, 
you might want to uh, have your, your people read up on this, your, your leaders read up on it, and uh, look at ways to, uh, to update your, your, um, your general orders, standard operating procedures, rules or regulation, to make them in line with uh, the, this executive order. The Post Commission's next scheduled meeting is set for February 25th. Class is back in session. Here's the latest progress report on Guam's Catholic schools. Superintendent of Catholic Schools, Dr. Juan Flores, has been making his rounds to see how operations have been flowing with the implementation of social distancing protocols. And after his visits, it's safe to say that if elementary students can mask up, so can you. I've been to almost all the schools, um, watching little two-year-olds, you know, walking six feet behind each other or kids in classrooms with their masks on and teachers behind sneeze guards. Um, it looks pretty good. Um, I think the, the students are practicing social distances, distancing, wearing their masks. If not, then they're being reminded. I think for the, the smaller kids, especially the younger kids, it's, a, it's an adjustment because they're glad to be back but they know they can't play and they can't interact like they used to. And although teachers and students are happy to be back, Dr. Flores is not happy with the continued delay of additional supplies that were supposed to be distributed before classes resumed. Things such as sneeze guards for desks and the cafeterias and HEPA filters were to be granted to the schools by GDOE through CARES Act funding, but they're still stuck in the procurement process. They've been waiting as far back as August, but Dr. Flores said they just got word yesterday that the quotations for the orders just went in a month ago. In addition, the purchase order for the HEPA filters have only now been released. I've let Mr. Fernandez know that I'm really disappointed. I don't know what it's gonna to take to get the process to go quicker, but when, when the health and well-being of the students is at stake and it continues to drag on, I think there needs to be some change in the system. And we are in an emergency situation. I'm not saying we ought to just ignore procurement laws, but as I've said before, somebody's got to start losing sleep um, to make sure things are done uh, more quickly. I get nice, polite responses when I ask almost every week, um, but it's really tough for me because I've got to go back to the principals and the teachers and explain to them that you know, the, 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 the process is not in our hands. Mm -hmm. And so we're at the mercy of DOE's uh, efforts. Flores clarified that he doesn't want to bash DOE completely. He explains that they've gotten a lot of support from the federal program's office. Now it's just up to the business office to get things done. Dr. Flores, being a former superintendent for DOE, said he believes a shortage of staff members may be a contributing factor to the delayed process. But because of what's going on, there are some staff members who could be freed up who have the knowledge and skills or can be trained very quickly to help with the processes. And again, because most of these processes are electronic, these folks don't have to physically be in, a, in, a, in the office together. He mentioned that everyone must make the best decisions for the health and well-being of the students, both private and public. Also on the agenda, Catholic Schools Week. On Monday, the governor signed a proclamation proclaiming January 31st to February 6th in recognition of Catholic Schools Week. Tomorrow, Archbishop Michael Burns will hold a virtual mass for students and staff to participate in virtually. The question of how much control we really have when it comes to our land and our waters is one we've been asking ourselves for decades. With the fight to keep the live fire training range out of the culturally and historically significant Latexan area highlights the island's uh, unfortunate position uh, of occasionally being able to offer public input but never truly having a say in the matter. Department of Agriculture's Chelsea Munya Breck dove into the details of how the National Oceanic and Atmosphere Administration's proposed rule on de designated critical habitats will make things more difficult for our local agencies. We control our territorial waters, but with this critical habitat designation, it makes it so that it's less in our control. Although it's supposed to be designed to control the effects of the federal government or the impact that they may have, so many of our projects 
are either federally funded or have a federal nexus, meaning they intersect with the federal government at some point on some level, even private projects. I mean, think of big housing developments. Those have a federal nexus, even though they're 100% privately funded. The proposed rule would deem the waters surrounding the island as a critical habitat with the exemption of military bases, all in efforts to preserve certain endangered coral species. But the question is, would establishing a critical habitat do anything but add more red tape for local agencies to go through when doing their preservation projects? We want to know, is the critical habitat effective? Is it going to work? Is it going to bring back coral that we haven't seen in our waters for more than a decade? Um, has it worked anywhere else? Because when we asked NOAA that question, they couldn't tell us that answer. They designated critical habitat in the Caribbean, uh, Atlantic Caribbean, and they don't even know if it's effective. They wanted to designate critical habitat around the entire island, even in areas that are not places where coral can grow. Um, Talafofo Bay is the perfect example they have that marked as an area for critical habitat, but there's no coral in Talafofo Bay, which is why everyone surfs there. While the overall intention for critical habitat designation is commendable, the execution is a different story. We already have our marine preserves. We already have strict laws and rules about what you can do in the preserves, about how you're not supposed to take coral or disturb the coral. But that doesn't mean anything when they're invoking the Endangered Species Act. The Endangered Species Act means that if something's already critic is already listed as an endangered species, then they have to automatically designate critical habitat. So they're following the rules, they're doing what they're supposed to do, but their process is flawed. And they should have done better um, in consulting us. I mean, when you look at that map, like automatically, like it feels like something you can squeeze in your heart. Like we're losing another piece of our control over our own land and waters to the federal government. And then you see that DOD is all in the red and they're okay. And then you look at all the other islands and see that it's the same way. Munya Breck says she's working with other islands also on the list for critical habitat to ensure that they offer up a firm, united stance on what is reasonable and acceptable to be submitted in letters to NOAA. Stay tuned next on Weekend Edition, we have trend spotting with Tyler Matanani and still to come, sports with Dave Delgado. Get up to the minute news, plus access to alerts, streaming radio, promotions, and more on your mobile device by downloading the KUAM News mobile app, available at the App Store now. While we've all been through a lot over the years, typhoons, earthquakes, and now COVID-19, we've been able to get through these together. For more than 80 years, Cabo's Insurance has been protecting your homes, your businesses, and the health of your family. We are here today and we'll be here tomorrow. There are better days ahead. Tomorrow's a new day filled with hope and choices. The possibilities of what we can achieve together are limitless. Let's continue to work together to ensure a brighter tomorrow for all of us. that got you talking this week, including a plot twist in the reopening of theaters, and us here at KUAM playing Cupid. I'm Tyler Matsunani, and this is your Trend Spotting Report. Just a quick update on how we're tackling COVID-19, more island residents are getting vaccinated, inching our way to some kind of normalcy. Public health continues to expand the eligibility for those who can get vaccinated, including lowering the age to those 55 or older. And public health, with the help of village mayors, are finally reaching some of the island's most vulnerable populations, those who are homebound. We continue to receive more doses of the vaccine and the Liberate Guam vaccination initiative hopes to achieve 80% coverage for residents by Liberation Day. Now onto perhaps one of the most anticipated reopenings, the box office. 
Movie theaters have been allowed to open since mid-January, prompting Tangle Theaters at the Micronesia Mall to initiate preparations for eager customers. Like other establishments, they must follow the executive order, making sure their plans for operations include all the safety protocols, including operating at only 50% occupancy. Operations manager Mary Lou Mahares said she even ordered beverages in bottles to cut down on contact employees will be having with moviegoers. But a day before Tangle was to reopen, there was a Shyamalan twist. You won't be able to purchase hot dogs, nachos, drinks or M&Ms because movie theaters cannot sell concessions. We just found out yesterday that the we will not be allowed to sell food at the concession, which is really going to be hurting the theaters, because what, what's the use of watching a movie without something to munch in? Without the concession, I think we just better close, because that's where we get our bread and butter for, you know, I think everyone knows. That's why our our price at the concession is a little bit high because we don't get anything from the the box office. Box offices were were doing by percentage, and before, especially if it's a blockbuster movie, it's seventy percent that goes to the studio, and thirty percent only goes to us. So without the concession, I think we're they're, they're just killing us again. We should note Public Health did include a small mention of the restriction in a January guidance memo. A lot of our viewers were also bummed to hear of the news including Angie Camacho who said, that's really unfortunate. I mean, why? My heart goes out to the theater owners. I know this will be really hard to keep doors open. Praying for things to take a better turn for the business. I don't like seeing businesses that have been around forever, that is well known by friends and families to be hurt like this. And Kraft Annie said, the government agencies are just doing what they want. Literally no science, no common sense at all. And of course, we took a poll and asked you if theaters should be able to sell concessions. 66% of you said they should be, and 34% said they shouldn't be allowed. And in crime news, Donovan Ornelas, accused of murdering and brutally beheading 51-year-old Andrew Ray Castro, appeared in court for his arraignment. Although he gave detectives the gruesome details of the crime, from doing drugs inside Castro's Santa Rita apartment to leaving his head in an abandoned car in Dededo, Ornelas pleaded not guilty by reason of mental illness defect. No doubt it bothered quite a few of our viewers, including Dana Munia Castro, who said, First he blames drugs, now he's mentally ill. This is something. Prayers to the Castro family. Herman Italic chimed in saying, Not guilty, huh? Mental defect, huh? The system has mental defect if they accept his plea. And Gina Manabusen said, Then keep him away from the public and off drugs. He is dangerous. What makes you think he won't do it again? Now let's shift gears to something a bit brighter. Valentine's Day is just around the corner and we're playing Cupid this year. Valentine's Day is coming and love is in the air. On the link, Sabrina and I playing matchmaker. So get a love connection on the link. We're looking for Guam's most eligible bachelors and bachelorettes. And we're gonna match you guys up. You're gonna go on some free dates for Valentine's Day weekends. Just hop on to kwave.com, fill out a super easy registration form and you could be making love on the link. Hey, all right. So one more time, you can apply as a contestant on The Love Connection directly at KUAM.com. And just before we let you go, we probably don't have to remind you that early Monday morning, we're airing Super Bowl 55 featuring the Kansas City Chiefs and the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Before the coin is tossed, there's a massive pregame show on CBS called The Super Bowl Today leading up to the kickoff of Super Bowl 55 on KUAM TV 11. It celebrates the NFL's past and present with special features and interviews from the integration of the league in the 1940s led by Kenny Washington and even Whitney Houston's legendary performance of the national anthem. And you're also going to want to tune into the link with Chris and Sabrina for some game coverage with trivia, games and prizes. 
I cannot wait for the big game on TV 11. Or maybe I'm just excited about eating pizza and wings in the morning. Until next week, stay safe, Guam. Adjust. How do you dare? You chip away at what's been built because you can do better. How do you dare? You chase away wrongs to make room for what's right. You. How do you dare? You stand while they sit and scream when they are silent. You combine your strengths to reject their weakness. You step up, stand out, and shape a new point of view. How do you dare? This is how you dare. Introducing the all new Elantra. Dave Delgado here with men's national basketball team coach EJ Calvo. Now the men's team was scheduled to play in the Philippines. The Philippines reached out to the Guam Basketball Confederation stating that they are unable to host the games because of travel restrictions. What does that put the team uh, now? Well, uh, everyone initially was supposed to host their own group. And our group, of course, includes uh, Australia, New Zealand, and Hong Kong. And uh, because none of us were uh, able to host any games uh, both in November and and uh, February of 2021. Uh, the Philippines was trying to put together a bubble to host everybody, their group and our group, and that fell through. So now the, um, the Philippines group actually, uh, which is Group A, found um, a host nation of Qatar to host their all their games. And then Guam and Hong Kong will be competing and we will get uh, our two games played against Hong Kong uh, and that'll be hosted by the country of Bahrain. And um, we are currently just working out all the details, uh, travel plans, um, uh, protocol in terms of testing and ensuring that we travel safely to Bahrain and are able to enter the bubble that they're forming there uh as, as and get ready to compete against hong kong and get those qualification games done uh in the next couple of weeks and once we do that uh we're hoping to get some court time uh prior to those games that we're going to be playing and that, that's important for us to uh to just you know get on the same page and get some rhythm um with our players before we um we before we compete in in two very important games for our qualification uh, we think these are the two most important games in our group. Um, uh, so we're really approaching it as as must-win situation. Any update on the rosters? Uh, we'll, we'll work on announcing our roster soon. Obviously, there's some strategy in, uh, to this. And um, teams are starting to let um, uh, FIBA know who, who they can expect to, to be registered. Uh, game day rosters are due at the technical meeting I think 24 hours prior to your game, but uh, we're going to be putting out at least um, our expanded roster, including a few alternates uh, that we're considering. And then as we finalize our flights, uh, we'll make other announcements. So um, yeah, expect changes. Um, a lot of guys that we've seen playing for Guam in the, in the past year to, to four years, um, won't be making the trip and uh, we'll be adding some new players that uh, uh, may have played for our junior national team, but this is gonna be their opportunity to uh, represent Guam on the senior level now. Scouting our opponent, what are we expecting when we step onto the court as far as maybe offensive and defensive strategies? Yeah, Hong Kong's um, very aggressive and, and they definitely have uh, talent. They have players that have played professionally in China and in the Hong Kong Pro League. Um, they have shooters. Uh, we're definitely going to have to extend out and, and defend uh, tight on the guards, um, not giving them any space, um, which is pretty much the case in most Asian, um, with most Asian teams, they're, they're, they're always good shooters. 
Um, they do have a couple big men, but um, I think we'll be okay in terms of matchups. Uh, we just have to make sure that we're, like I said, um, rotating properly and that we're not getting mixed up so that we cause any mismatches or, or, um, or, or bad situations. Uh, we'll try to, you know, stick to our defensive game plan. Um, uh, offensively, we think we can run uh, when we need to. We think we can play the half court game when we need to and, and uh, really control the paint. And um, like I said, it's an opportunity now for some young guards to, to prove themselves that they can shoot the ball from the outside and also uh, create for others. So I'm pretty excited about this matchup. And speaking with the players here locally, are, are you stressing the fact that they need to take care of themselves, take care of their bodies, and kind of limit their uh, uh, social uh, gatherings just to make sure that everybody's going to be able to, to make the trip safely? Oh, absolutely. Uh, every, every player that's been uh, uh, committed to make uh, this competition and play for Guam has been uh, trying the best they can to not only get their workouts, uh, but do it in a safe way. And um, for the next couple of weeks, uh, it's daily um, exercise of just getting, getting hundreds of shots up. Uh, it's not really time to, to really get in shape or start training. By now, it's more of a rhythm uh, activity. So uh, everyone's just got to maintain that rhythm and stay healthy and um, as a, as all the details come in, uh, we'll be ready to go and, and represent Guam again. Uh, it won't be as long a trip either. Um, uh, you know, definitely uh, less than two weeks, uh, maybe just a little over a week. And then of course, we'll be um, coming into Guam protocol in terms of uh, our return to Guam uh, safely and quarantining before we uh, can return home. Well, crossing our fingers, when can we expect the team to leave Island? And when is the first game uh, going to be against Hong Kong? Yeah, the, uh, the schedule was uh, just released to us, and it, it may not have gone public yet, but um, we received a letter that we're going to be playing on February 19th in Bahrain, uh, as long as everything goes smoothly with the teams arriving. Uh, so that being our first game, uh, we're looking at getting out there by the uh, 15th or 16th uh, in order to give ourselves uh, some time to acclimate and, um, and some court time together uh, as we prepare for that game on the 19th. Super Bowl 55 going down Monday, February 8th, right here on the stations of KUAM. Get up early and catch all the pregame stuff leading up to the big game. We'll get you started at 2.30 in the morning with that other pregame show taking you all the way to kickoff at 9.30 on KUAM TV 11 with the Kansas City Chiefs repeat led by Patrick Mahomes. Or will Tom Brady lead the Buccaneers to a home field win at 43 years old? The GOAT going head to head with the young phenom. Crazy times during this pandemic, but Super Bowl 55 will definitely keep us busy with a very exciting game. Brady, owner of six Super Bowl rings versus Mahomes, one from last year. Who's going to flex on who and who's going to be taking home that ring? KC's high-powered offense, Tampa Bay's relentless defense. Who do you have winning Super Bowl 55? Guam's auto appearance specialist, Elegant Reflections, has been providing the automotive industry with professional detailing and car care products at its highest quality from complete detailing, full interior detailing, exterior detailing, headlamp restoration, hand washing, seat and carpet shampoo, engine degreasing, undercarriage cleaning, paint sealant, fabric protection, paint oxidation removal, and so much more. Visit us at our new location. Call 646-5555 for an appointment. Elegant Reflections, Guam's auto appearance specialist. Over 20 years of experience. It makes myself and it makes my team members very proud to work for an organization that has been on Island for many years with its focus on reliability, dependability, and commitment to the communities that they operate in. Matson's a great corporate citizen to the community. We all benefit from any sort of environmental commitment we make. One of the ways that we do that is with our Adahi Utano program. There's action behind it, and so action breeds commitment. With the Kaimana Gila coming to Guam, this brings a new age and modernization to the island. 
it's exciting for me because it's a brand new ship and we can carry more freight into the islands. It just shows growth for Guam and Micronesia. Matson would be nothing without its customers and we hope to continue to serve you for decades to come. And before we close out the news tonight, our latest round of birthday shout outs from the Coldstone Creamery Birthday Club. Your weekend birthday shout outs are like this on Saturday. Happy birthday to Joey Michael Rabago Jr. Happy blessed first birthday to Buggy. We wish you nothing but a lifetime of love and happiness with love from Mama, Dada, and your brothers. Also, happy blessed birthday wishes to George F. Peretta as he celebrates another year of giving. Thanks for all you do with much love and gratitude from your family. Happy birthday, George and Joey. And on Sunday, February the 7th, the day before the Super Bowl on Guam, Lourdes Cordero, happy birthday from family, friends, and your neighbors. We hope each and every one of you have an amazing island weekend, an amazing Super Bowl, and an amazing birthday because it's all about you this weekend. Remember, you can be a part of the Cold Stone Creamery Birthday Club by registering online at KOAM.com. That's all the time that we have for tonight. You all have a safe weekend from all of us here at Guam's News Network.